Bearing the insignia of Calypso, a refitted Catalina PBY, the long-range patrol amphibian that earned fame during World War II, leaves the densely populated shoreline of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, co-piloted by Philippe Cousteau. Captain Cousteau's newest research wing, converted from bird of war to peaceful pursuits, will supplement Calypso's research vehicles to provide even greater mobility for marine exploration. Destination now, the tropical islands off Yucatan, one of the few remaining areas where the Caribbean waters remain a sanctuary for dazzling marine life. Cousteau will study the regions bordering the Yucatan Peninsula, where upwellings of deep waters rich in nutrients sustain the prosperity of a great variety of sea creatures. Cousteau will also search for sharks to investigate the reported phenomenon that some sharks enter caves here to sleep. It has been generally thought that open ocean sharks must never stop swimming to keep water constantly moving over their gills for oxygen. If some of these sharks do in fact come to rest in inshore caves, Cousteau will attempt to film and study at close range the unexpected phenomenon of sleeping sharks. Specially equipped to carry eight men for undersea exploration, Captain Cousteau circles over the tropical jungle of Yucatan and the stone remains of an ancient Mayan religious center. Before their culture collapsed in the 10th century, the Maya excelled in architecture, constructing great pyramids like this towering temple of Chichen Itza. Ten centuries later, we descend off Kantori Island to film Yucatan's underwater wilderness. Hard landings are a characteristic of the heavy PBYs. Approaching the sea at a low speed, Philippe then employs the power-on technique, flying the ship onto the water to rendezvous with Calypso. Landing a fully loaded PBY is more a test of seamanship than airmanship. Cousteau, Flight Captain Hank Lillibeck and Philippe are picked up by a Zodiac for transfer to Calypso.
For the first time, members of the Calypso team now assembled here will have the opportunity to operate with the combined forces of the heavily equipped but slow research ship Calypso and of the new long-range airborne diving platform. Below the world-traveled hull of Calypso lies a region where difficult surface conditions protect the marine community from excessive human pressure. At a depth of 90 feet along a colorful low rocky ridge, we are greeted by amberjacks, schooling porkfish and blue tanks. Also, there is practically no coral formation here. Tropical fish thrive and reach unusually large size. The colony makes way for the great barracuda, whose sharp, nail-like teeth lock into its prey. Survival in the sea often depends upon concealment. Stingrays, preyed upon by sharks, hide beneath the sand. The stingray's defense is its flexible tail, armed with one or several darts coated with venom, which can strike out in any direction, delivering severe and painful wounds. Another dive team investigates the skeletons of ships that have found their resting place in the Caribbean. From the days of the Spanish Silver Fleet, preyed upon by marauding pirates, to ships of our time, Thousands of vessels have been sunk by hurricanes. The ghostly hulls encrusted with barnacles and coral have become havens for small fish and stingrays. The stingray has powerful teeth capable of crushing clams, shellfish and other bottom-dwelling animals that are found in abundance here. A fine meshed plankton net is slowly hauled up from the depths to Calypso. In the survey of the productivity of this region, water samples will be studied to determine the richness of microscopic organisms. The concentration of plant and animal plankton is directly related to the abundance of other aquatic creatures, for plankton is the prime food supply of the sea. Okay. Oh, we have a lot of goodies in here. Ah, huh? Really? Well, okay. There are many living specimens to be observed under the microscope. Hello. Ça, ça vient de... In Calypso's laboratory, Cousteau and Louis Preslin will catalog the various plankton species. Projected on our microscope screen is a minute amphipod, a crustacean which will grow to one half inch in length. This active zooplankton or animal plankton will spend a wandering life carried by the currents. In our microscopic gallery of the planktonic world, among the most abundant is the lively copepod, another small crustacean that feeds on microscopic algae. An annelid worm moves seductively. The transparent larva of a larger crustacean energetically quivers with new life.
A barnacle in the larval stage extends its foot to sift small organisms from the water. Skeleton shrimps that normally live on hydroid plants are accidentally washed loose and then join the plankton community. This kind of larval fish will grow to be a free-swimming flounder. The immature squid early develops the ability to propel itself and will soon become independent of currents. Some of the larger floating planktonic forms, such as jellyfish and the flowing calm jelly, combined by the trillions with drifting algae and minute animals. Plankton forms the base of the food cycle that sustains all creatures, from anchovies to sharks to giant whales, throughout the open waters of the Caribbean. Now Captain Cousteau and crew fly to Yucatan's Isla Mujeres, where a native lobster diver nicknamed Valvula has reported the astonishing discovery of sharks sleeping in deep water caves. The PBY affords flexibility of operation over coral reefs and shallow lagoons through which Calypso could never penetrate. Giant manta rays, sometimes called devilfish, are sighted flying in formation through crystalline waters. In our helicopter, we will photograph the spectacle from the air, as Philippe and a team of divers speed from the flying boat to the scene. Only with a seaplane could we move men and equipment so rapidly. Sea conditions are perfect for filming the giant manta rays. The PPY team dives in the midst of the giant animals, which are circling around like underwater airships. While eyeing us, the manta rays cruise back and forth over the flattened ribs of an old wreck. Head on, they come. These huge animals are concentrated here to feed upon plankton the minute organisms we studied under the microscope. The feeding rays often cup their two fleshy horns to form a funnel. These appendages help drive small crustaceans and other planktonic food into their cavernous mouth. The plankton is strained from the seawater, which rushes out through the ventral gill slits under their massive bodies. Manta rays earned the name devilfish because for streamlining, they stretched their horns forward, resembling the horn head of Satan himself. Mm -hmm. 
These creatures, with their 22-foot wingspan, are incredibly gentle and never dangerous to man, although a collision with the 3,000-pound titans is to be avoided. Unlike the bottom-dwelling stingray, the manta's short buggy whip tail has no stinging dart. With horns stretched forward, the perfectly streamlined manta easily outswims Philippe, who attempts to follow with camera. With eyes on the sides of their heads, the mentors are able to see laterally and below and keep us within their vision at all times as they casually feed. For us, it has been an unexpected interlude. We will continue on in search of the sleeping sharks and leave the devilfish gormandizing in their pastures of plankton. Calypso's PBY heads for the region of the sleeping sharks. Mexican author and filmmaker Ramon Bravo will guide Cousteau to the deep caves of Yucatan's Isla Mujeres, or Island of Women, in which he claims to have seen sharks in a state of sleep. Heavily laden with men and diving gear, the flying boat needs a long runway. Seven miles off Isla Mujeres, anchor is dropped. The diver's ready room is the plexiglass blister that once enclosed machine gunners during World War II. The team transfers to the seaplane Zodiac, tied off alongside the plane. Cousteau is ready now to investigate the phenomenon of sleeping sharks. We descend through 80 feet of clear waters to a seafloor of white sand accented by distant stony ranges and low limestone caves. We proceed toward the caves with shark billies our simple, peaceful protection to drive off sharks when they become too inquisitive. A large, grim-looking moray eel seems to be guarding the entrance to this cave. We enter under the moray, where sharks have been sighted by Ramon Bravo. A 
large sea turtle is surprised by your light. It swims off toward another cave. Cautiously, we search cave interiors and cavern openings. The ceiling of a limestone cave is porous. Bubbles from the diver's regulators percolate up through the encrusted canopy. The rising bubbles attract a solitary angelfish. It's inconceivable that the angelfish has an appetite for air bubbles. Can it be that the angelfish is just having fun? As he seems very selective, more probably the bubbles carry tiny animals or algae which make interesting eating. At the entrance of another cave, we make a new acquaintance, named for its large squirrel-like eyes. It is a red and gold squirrel fish. Tame, yet determined to hold onto its pockmarked home, it grunts in complaint. An intermediate creature between more ancient forms and more advanced perch-like fish, the squirrel fish, has been sounding off for millions of years. During courtship, its impassioned grunts can be heard above the water. There are dozens of caves in the area but the sharks are reported to sleep in only a few of them. Revealed in the back of a cave is a large grouper. Cousteau sees that the grouper has been grievously injured. A fisherman's large hook is embedded in its lower jaw, and the entire left side of the grouper's head is inflamed. The men will attempt to remove the hook and trailing leader from the wounded fish. Bernard Delamotte tries to come to the aid of the grouper. He pulls at the leader, but it burns through his gloved hand. Cousteau investigates one cave after another. Perhaps this is the wrong season for sleeping sharks. A very old barnacle-encrusted sea turtle with a sucker-mouthed remora on its back. For Bernard, this may be his last opportunity to swim with one of these rapidly vanishing animals. Renowned for its open sea navigational abilities and long migrations to nesting beaches, the sea turtle is a clumsy and easy prey on shore. Although theoretically, protection is now being afforded turtles on some breeding grounds, they are still relentlessly hunted for food. 
and shot at by sportsmen when they navigate the seas. Cousteau continues his systematic exploration. The entrance of a low, wide cavern looms ahead. The inhabitants of the cave's deep interior are hidden in darkness. Finally, our lights reveal far back in the cave a shark. The shark has also seen us. His small milky eyes, as well as the fleshy barbels that hang down from his upper jaw like fangs, tell us he's a nurse shark. His eyes never leave us, and a young remora moves nervously over his head. Cousteau and men of Calypso make systematic daily dives to the three main underwater caverns off Yucatan's Isla Mujeres to examine the sharks that purportedly come to these caves to sleep. The lights play upon a large bull shark. It is resting on the bottom, motionless. Its blunt bull-like head from which it gets its name is partially hidden by a growth of algae Jacques Del Couture cautiously touches the animal to see if it is really asleep. The shark does not move, but its left eye stares at Jacques. Until Valvola's recent discovery, the bull shark had not been known to retire within caves. For more than two months, we continue our dives to try to determine why and how often sharks frequent caves. Here, another nurse shark is found. This shark is a large male, evidenced by the claspers, a pair of elongated reproductive organs on the pelvic fin. It is the mating season, the time when the males of most species are more aggressive. Unlike the bull shark, which swims with powerful strokes of its tail, the more supple nurse shark undulates like a snake. Ramon Bravo has indicated to Captain Cousteau that he had discovered six caves in the area in which sharks were sleeping. There could be more. It has been a common assumption that open ocean sharks are forced to swim continuously for their entire lifetime in order to supply oxygen to their bodies. On the contrary, the bottom-dwelling shark, like this nurse shark, breathes rhythmically, pumping water in through its mouth and out through its gill slits. The nurse shark has a muscular system that enables it to breathe while resting or sleeping on the bottom.
Some scientists think that this ability, inherited from earlier forms of fish, has been lost by species of sharks that have taken to open water. The nurse shark has suddenly become aware of us. We make no attempt to impede its exit. Above the white sand shores of Isla Mujeres, within the Sacil Ha Hotel, Philippe Cousteau probes the mysteries of sleeping sharks with Dr. Carl Cushino, shark expert from Texas A&M University, Ramon Bravo, and local diver Valvola Garcia, who first saw sharks in caves and reported it to Bravo. You see, uh, the thing is, the, the sharks come into sleep or not? The, the shark coming because they they uh, uh, has a, uh, a little shark uh, babies or not are coming to this cave because are are bad conditions uh, sick sick I, I myself know of no uh, nothing in the literature which uh, indicates that, that bull sharks have been found resting on bottom or in caves or anything like that of course the whole this whole area of, of, of behavior of this particular family of sharks is is not one which is easily studied because they are so large <laughs> and some of them are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really don't know an awful lot about the behavior of, of this group of sharks. And we may, you know, we may be adding to that lore of behavior now with, uh, with this discovery that some of these sharks, in fact, do rest on the bottom. You've never heard of, of this sort of I incidents? Never, I never heard of them. You, no. you, you neither, Philip. No, I've, uh, as a matter of fact, when I wrote uh, my book on sharks, I was absolutely sure that uh, certain species never slept. I think these sharks come into the caves because in the cave the current is more stronger. But if you see the animals, they, they, they pump the water, you see? Yeah, right. See? It's not easy for these animals to be like that. But how long in, in, uh, in the cave at uh, La Punta I, and also at the other one we call the Calypso, there is no current in the cave. This is what you think. This is what you think. I, the what? I um, mix the sand, I, say, I make some silt and the sand goes up in the water and it goes right back down. Well, but well so this, this could, if there was a current there, and we'd have to go down there and try to measure whatever current there was. Cousteau and team prepare to descend through strongly running surface currents to test if there are also currents in the caves below. They will also conduct experiments to determine what water conditions within the caves might attract the sharks. Cousteau enters a cave where he had seen a shark at rest. Careful not to create eddies by his own movement, Cousteau places a plastic bag of fluorescent dye in the back of the cave where the previous day a bull shark was breathing in seawater through its mouth. With a spear, Cousteau will puncture the bag and release the dye. First, he signals the cameraman to film this test that will detect the presence or absence of current. Currents could possibly enable sharks to breathe while resting by carrying water into their gaping mouths and over their gills. Their bodies would be oxygenated without the necessity of swimming. Cousteau prods the dye, which slowly spreads evenly, but which does not flow in any direction. There is no evidence of a current in the cave. The next step is to determine if the water trapped within the cave is different from the water outside. 
Utilizing nets and bottles, we take several samples of the water in the caves. It has been speculated that fresh water seeping up from underground rivers beneath the porous limestone caves could attract the sharks. When the bottle is reversed, its valves are closed to trap the water sample. The water samples are passed on to scientist John Hill, who, with graduate students from the Texas A&M Remote Sensing Center, will analyze the seawater of the shark caves to get a synoptic picture of conditions below. Cousteau will be supplied data about salinity, nutrients, and biologically active substances in the caves. The measurements reveal that although the salinity is very slightly lower inside the caves, there is no fresh water supply. There is also no evidence of temperature or nutrient variances substantial enough to attract the sharks. Yet here is another large bull shark. Here is evidence on film that bull sharks, although they belong to the open sea community, do have the ability to irrigate their gills while resting on the bottom. Generally, marine creatures enter caves or crevices for protection. Why would these powerful sharks need protection? Is it, perhaps, because they are sick and in pain that they seek shelter here? In any event, they never stay long. The agitated bull shark is anxious to leave, and the men are in his way. The shark finally brushes past the divers and departs. But exactly why he entered the cave still remains a mystery. Off Isla Mujeres, there is a series of night dives from the PBY to see if sharks inhabit the caves at night. Local lobster divers have never descended at night because sharks are known to be nocturnal feeders and they fear the bull sharks would attack them. In our day and night surveillance of the caves, we swim toward one of the caverns where we saw a bull shark during the day. In the back of the cave, we discover a blue-jawed parrotfish, one of the largest we have ever seen. Cautiously, we continue our investigation. In another cave, a grouper retreats from our light. And now, not a shark, 
but our old friend the sea turtle emerges slowly with sleep dulled eyes. Our lights may have confused his biological clock. For the day's turtle, dawn has come too soon. Cousteau has not found a single shark in a cave at night. Then in open water, a shark. I know that when sharks gather in excitement, it is time to leave. I signal that the divers are coming up. Our investigations have dispelled some of the legends about the sleeping sharks, but there are question marks that remain. Before leaving Yucatan, Calypso forces converge off the southern tip of Isla Mujeres. A great sea monster-like mass is moving slowly over the shallow white sands. The amorphous mass is encircled and approached by divers and underwater cameramen. It resembles an oil slick, but there is no such pollution here. The divers will examine this monster-like formation. A wall of hundreds of thousands of fish parades before us, moving as if it were a single organism. They are white grunts, named for the dominant white pattern of their upper bodies and the grunting sound they produce by grinding their sharp teeth together. We wonder why these grunts, normally found in smaller schools, have congregated in such overwhelming numbers. It is apparently not for feeding purposes, for the white sands here are barren of the grunts' primary foods, shrimp, crustaceans, and small fish. The large collection might be a spawning aggregation. Although courtship displays are not in evidence, the grunts could be swimming together all year round in order to be sure to find partners when the mating season comes. Another theory is that by massing, the grunts present a formation that may frighten away predators. Allowing the diver or predator to pass through, the school becomes two large organisms. Some etologists believe this maneuver serves to confuse the attacker. Whatever the theories about the motivations of animals, 
we have a tendency to oversimplify. We either endow them with our own feelings or demean them by crediting them with only the elementary drives of food, territory, and procreation. Yet each one is an individual being with senses sometimes more complex than ours. Here, in the waters of Yucatan, we have been spellbound by such phenomena as the sleeping sharks, the rally of giant manta rays, and this moving wall of grants. But these encounters merely heighten our expectations and add to our curiosity about the sea and its mysteries, which, like the sea itself, are boundless. On the golden seascape of the Caribbean that fringes the Yucatan Peninsula, the PBY prepares to take off to explore other phenomena in these tropical seas. It becomes increasingly difficult to unravel the mysteries of the sea. For our further explorations, we will have to mobilize all available technology, from satellites to submarines, so that we may not only better understand, but wisely benefit from the intricate life process that originates in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> 